At this point, I would please ask you to stand, and I will ask the honor guard from our boys at the police department to please post the colors. At this point, I'd like you to remain standing, please, and ask the Boy Scouts of Troop 53 to bring our post collection of antique flags into the hall, and they will be displaying them against that far wall over there. Thank you. Thank you very much. At this point, I would like you to please join us in our pledge to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please take your seats. I have a few people to thank. I hope you all managed to get a, a program. Um, we have a guest speaker, uh, Commander Scott Carroll. New glasses, sorry. Uh, from the Naval College, he'll be introduced later. Representing our Board of Selectmen is the Chairman, Paul Silva. Representative William Strauss joins us again, as he always manages to do. Paul Halpity has brought the great secret weapon of Hammond Town School, the concert band. <coughs> Willow Dowling has brought the beautiful voices of the Hammond Town Chorus. As you know, the police department is here. The Battle Poison uh, Troop 53 of the Boy Scouts is here in mass, taking care of our other flags. I don't think I see any Girl Scouts here, though. We've got our signals crossed somewhere. I don't know. I'd like to thank them all for being here. I'd like to thank all of you for being here because... We're doing this because we, as veterans, would want to honor our fellow veterans, and it's also nice to see a room full of people who feel likewise. Uh, it's always a pleasure to look out and see not only veterans, but friends of veterans and veteran supporters and the young folks. Young folks, thank you all very much for being here, the band, the chorus, the Boy Scouts. It's always nice to see everyone gathering here in this beautiful hall. At this point, I am going to ask my chaplain, uh, Richard Langhoff, to come up and offer a prayer. Uncover, please. Lord, we ask for blessings on all those who have served their country in the armed forces. We ask for healing for the veterans who have been wounded in body and soul in conflicts around the globe. We pray especially for the young men and women and the thousands who are coming home from Iraq and Afghanistan with injured bodies and traumatized spirits. 
bring solace to them, O Lord. May we pray for them when they cannot pray. We ask for an end to wars and the dawning of a new era of peace as a way to honor all the veterans of past wars. Have mercy on all our veterans from World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Bring peace to their hearts and peace to the regions they fought in. Bless all the soldiers who served in non-combative posts. May their calling to service continue in their lives in many positive ways. Give us all the creative vision to see a world which, grown weary with fighting, moves to affirming the life of every human being and so move beyond war. Hear our prayer, O Prince of Peace. Hear our prayer. Cover. Thank you very much, Richard. That was very well done. At this point, I would ask the Hammond Town Band to play their world famous Hammond Town March. <laughs>
our guest speaker. You see what I'm talking about now, aren't you, huh? Yeah. At this point, I'm going to uh, introduce a man who is, as I say, the trade needs no introduction because he supports us readily, annually, and that would be our state representative, William Strauss. I'll ask him to say a few words, please. Thank you, Mike. It's a pleasure again to be here on Veterans Day in Manapoise. I must say, uh, this is probably the biggest crowd I remember uh, being here, and that's just wonderful. Uh, as uh, Commander Lamoureux indicated at the beginning, uh, it's, just, it's not just about the veterans who are here, but the fact that uh, so many others come to reflect and honor what they have done in their service to the country. So I wanted to thank those who, first of all, those who made the event possible today by their participation. I always have the most difficult part of the program each year, which is to immediately follow uh, the band and the chorus. And we thank them again uh, for gracing us with their talents. And uh, they're just an essential part of what we do here every Veterans Day. Also want to thank the Boy Scouts, and the Police Honor Guard for their participation and also to add my welcome to Commander Harrell. I hope for years you remember your visit and, and stay with us and for a short time here in Mount Boise fondly. Uh, we're, we consider ourselves a special community. So thank you for being here. Whenever I am asked to speak at an event like this, and this one particularly every year, it gets to be a difficult, or it is a difficult challenge because uh, so many others with greater intellects and, and, and perception uh, have rendered their views. And so, not surprisingly, I think it's appropriate to think of what others have said. So, I'd like to convey a short thought to you that was expressed by President Kennedy the first time he got to make, as president, an address on Veterans Day, which was to quote a philosopher, Augustine, that the purpose of war is peace. And when you think about it historically, this event started at the moment, the second, at which the wor World War I concluded, on what was originally known as Armistice Day. And it's that conflict, if you will, uh, between that moment of war and that moment of peace which starts, which is always the tension that runs through this, that in order to have peace, we ask young people at the start of their adult lives to risk and often sacrifice everything for that moment of peace, which we all hope lasts forever. But we know that it doesn't, that the conflicts continue. So there has to be, or there is, a continual request on, our, on the part of our country that in order to keep having peace in the future, we ask people to serve at a young age and uh, defend our country. And so it's uh, a, a modest request that we take time out to honor them, to honor the veterans who are sitting here throughout the room and say thank you, and to realize that we have an obligation to respect and lead our lives for what they have done for us. And to me, that is what Veterans Day is about. So I want to thank everyone for attending. It shows a commitment that we all have for the service that has been provided by, to us and the gift that has been provided to us by the veterans. Thank you. And it's an honor to be a part of the ceremony again this year. At this point, I would ask the uh, old Hammertown Concert Band to do their rendition of America.
with the crowd to get good foot up there. Too. First of all, I want to uh, uh, thank the Legion for allowing me the honor of uh, saying a few words here today. Across this great nation and throughout the world, Americans will pause today to honor the brave fighting men and women who have for more than 230 years have underwritten our freedom by their duty, their honor, and their selfless service to our country. Let us never forget that we cannot rightfully celebrate the joy of our freedom without remembering the great price paid for that freedom. Google the term national debt and you'll quickly receive a search result of 26.7 million websites. Most deal with a very serious issue of government overspending and the accumulation of two centuries of federal deficits, but very few bring up the biggest national debt of them all, that which America owes to its veterans. Today we honor the more than one million American men and women who have given their lives for their country since our nation's founding. Our debt to these heroes can never be repaid, but our gratitude and respect must last forever. For many veterans of our nation, for many, for many veterans, our nation was important enough to endure long separations from their families, missed births of their children, they freeze in sub-zero temperatures, they bake, bake in wild jungles, lose limbs, and far too often lose their lives. Military spouses have to endure career interruptions, frequent changes of addresses, and a disproportionate share of parental responsibilities. The children often had to endure changes in schools, separation from families and friends, and the hardest of all, the uncertainty as to whether mom or dad will return from the next combat tour. You cannot fight a war without veterans, and while the utopian idea of society without war is appealing, let us not forget that wars have liberated slaves, stopped genocide, and toppled terrorists. There is a quote from my favorite general, General George S. Patton, that I'd like to share with you. And I quote, Courage is fear holding on a minute longer. End of quote. Historians have said that Dwight Eisenhower was prouder of being a soldier than he was of being president. And while relatively few veterans ever reach the rank of general, pride is in one's military service is a bond shared by all who have served. Fewer than 10% of Americans can claim the title veteran. And while the great phrase, uncommon valor was a common virtue, has been so often repeated that it risks becoming a cliche, it is no less true. While we pay homage to all Americans, uh, veterans today, I particularly want to thank our Vietnam veterans this day. They served in a war that deeply divided our nation, but America is resilient. We are a country of temperance, compassion, and reason, and with the passage of time, we healed our wounds. In 1789, George Washington said, and I quote, the willingness with which our young people are likely to serve in any war, no matter how justified, shall be directly proportional as to how they perceive the veterans of earlier wars were treated and appreciated by their country. How profound. George Washington warned us 190 years prior to the end of the Vietnam War. I am sure that many of you visited Vietnam Memorial in Washington, D.C. During the day, the black granite absorbs all the sunlight that radiates the heat during the evening hours. If the evening is cool and crisp, you can see a mist coming off the wall. It has been said it's as if 
58,253 names are breathing life into your body. These men and women gave their lives so that all of us can continue to live the American dream. We must ask ourselves as a nation, are we serving our veterans even half as well as they have served us? As we honor the 23 million living veterans from the greatest generation to the latest generation, let us never forget this debt that is owed. No government commission or single dollar amount can adequately repay what has been given to all of us throughout our nation's history. Through their blood, their service and sacrifice, veterans have given us freedom, security, and the greatest nation on earth. It is impossible to put a price on that. We must remember them. We must appreciate them. God bless all of you for being here today. God bless our veterans. And God bless America. Thank you. Very nice, Paul. At this point, um, I want to compose myself. I would like to introduce someone who is known to many of you, Barry Denham. He's the veteran agent for the town of Mount of Course in Rochester and has served wonderfully in that role for many years now. He's also my adjutant, my right-hand man at the post, the man I rely on for everything as officers have done with their sergeants forever and ever. Amen. First Sergeant Denham, veterans agent, come on up here and say hello to the folks. Thank you, Mike, and uh, Representative Strauss, uh, Paul, thank you very much, uh, the, and everybody that's here. What a, what a wonderful Veterans Day. Uh, it's, it always amazes me how well we can get people out and, and how well the kids perform. And, uh, you know, every, every time you, want, you, you, you think, well, what's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? What's going to happen next? We're living in the best country in the world. Every time we graduate a class from Old Hammond Town, we have a class come into Old Hammond Town that was equally as good. When a uh, faculty member retires, we have a faculty member that comes in that's equally as good. This, this is what keeps our nation great and keeps our nation going. Um, and now I've got to get back to what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, I'm the veterans agent for Mattapoise and Rochester, and it's my job to, uh, and I don't like to call it assist, and I don't like it to call, call it aid. Uh, we provide services to individuals that have earned it through their military service. And um, we encourage anyone that, that needs services to come in and see us. Uh, Paula Butterfield, my secretary, arranged this whole thing, as she does every year, um, is there. To, between Usually Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Sometimes it's Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. But uh, she's in there um, three days a week. And uh, anybody that uh, is a veteran uh, or knows of a veteran that may um, need a little bit of a nudge through some difficult times, give us a call or come on down and, and we'll do our best to help you out. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Barry. I just want to tag on to what Barry just mentioned there because uh, you, you will never know, and I will never know, I only have a little bit of knowledge about this, what his little office, he and Paula, accomplished for the towns of Mattapoisett and Rochester and their veteran population, you would not believe what he does for veterans. He's a wonderful man. At this point, I'm going to uh, ask my good friend Paul Halpenny, speaking of great people that replace great people, and his band, they're going to do the Grand Old Flag.
privilege of uh, giving you some background information on our special guest today, Commander Robert S. Harrell, who is on the staff at the College of Operational and Strategic Leadership in uh, well, right now, that whole group is, is in Newport, Rhode Island at the uh, War College. <coughs> Robert joined the Maritime Operations Center Assist and Assess Team in February of 2010 after completing the five-week Maritime Staff Operators course. He is a liaison officer for the 10th Fleet and the Pacific Fleet for developing and optimizing their organization, process, and overall performance. He specializes in joint fires and force applications, kinetic and non-kinetic. Maybe he'll explain that one to me later. As well as information and knowledge management. Prior to this tour, he coordinated Navy experimentation at the operational level of war at the Navy Warfare Development Command, where he managed diverse teams participating in design, conduct, and analysis of many experiments such as operational level command and control during the Trident Warrior 2009. His operational tours spanned from 1992 to 2006, including junior officer and department head tours with Striker Force of Fighter Command 87 and Chief of Air Wing Tour with Carrier Air Wing 14. He's accumulated over 2,600 flight hours, and he says that he's had 700 relatively <laughs> successful carrier landings. He's still walking and breathing, so I guess he did, um, in the FA-18C and E aircraft, while flying from the decks of some very notable and memorable uh, aircraft carriers, the U.S. Theodore Roosevelt, the USS Enterprise, and the USS Ronald Reagan. He completed five deployments, five to the Mediterranean Sea, Western Pacific, and Arabian Gulf, and served in Operation Southern Watch in Iraq, Deny Flight Bosnia, Deliberate Force Bosnia, Allied Force Kosovo, Enduring Freedom Afghanistan, and Iraqi Freedom in Iraq. The shore assignments include attending the Navy Fighter Weapons School, that's Top Gun for those of you keeping track, and subsequently serving from 1996 to 98 as an integrated strike warfare instructor at the Navy Strike Warfare Center, which became the Naval Strike and Air Force, uh, the, I'm sorry, I do do eventually, which became the Naval Strike and Air Force Center. From 2002 to 4, he served on the staff of the Chief of Naval Operations, refining and implementing tests and programs. From 2007 to 9, he served as an experiment coordinator at the Navy Warfare Development Command in Newport, Rhode Island. He's a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy in 1988 with a Bachelor of Science in Aerospace Engineering and completed postgraduate education at the Naval War College, graduating in 2009 with an M.A. in National Security and Strategic Studies. Somewhere in the middle of all this, he married and has a two-year-old daughter. And you know what? As young as he looks, that man's getting ready to retire next June. I give you Robert Howard. Well, good morning. I, I really am humbled to be here today. Uh, this is an incredible turnout. Uh, I've not spent a lot of time in Mount Poise until today, but I am, I'm getting more impressed by the minute. I particularly want to thank the Boy Scouts guys there in the back. You're doing all the standing. So, you know, having done a lot of parades myself, I know that you want to make sure don't lock your knees, keep flexing them, you know, wiggle those toes, and uh, thank you for hanging in there. Uh, we don't want anybody, you know, taking a face plant. And, and of course, uh, the band. You guys are fantastic, and the, and the chorus, uh, outstanding. Thank you all for being here. You know, I, uh, one quick story just to kind of set the stage of what it's like to be a veteran before I go to prepared remarks. It's just that, you know, it's the friendships and the bonds that you have, and even though you may not have even met each other, it's funny. You know, I'm here for five minutes, and, and uh, Gerald comes up to me, and he's retired Air Force pilot. And, you know, so pilots kind of find each other. It's like magnets. 
And so immediately, you know, we're swapping sea stories, air stories, and you know, there's that bond that's there uh, just because of our shared service. So for anybody that, you know, the kids are growing up, um, and I'll hit this, but you'll see there's a lot of really good things about being and serving in the military and, uh, and the friendships you develop along. them. So as was mentioned, it's, you know, it's the 11th hour, the 11th day, the 11th month. Um, and as we speak, you know, a wreath is being laid at the tomb of the unknown soldiers in Arlington National Cemetery in D.C. And there are similar events that are being held in Paris at the tomb of the unknowns underneath the Arc de Triomphe and in the tomb of the unknown warrior in London and in many other countries around the world. Because when the armistice was signed in 1918, you know, Veterans Day is not just a special day in America. It's actually celebrated around the world. And all the nations around the world remember their military members, both alive and dead, who have fought in any war. So veterans, you know, who are they? They include people like Corporal Frank Buckles, who turned 110 years old this last February. He's the last surviving member from World War I, believe it or not. He was born before the first airplane flew. And unfortunately, he actually died just a few weeks after his 110th birthday, just this year. Veterans include Private First Class Serena Butcher, who is from Oklahoma's National Guard. And she died just 10 days ago from an IED in Afghanistan. She was 19. And veterans also include a friend of mine, a Navy Captain Tushar Tembe, who was born in Bombay, India, emigrated to New York City, became my commanding officer of an F-18 squadron, and actually was the commanding officer of the nuclear-powered carrier of the USS Truman. He unfortunately just passed away this last week at the age of 49 from a sudden heart attack. But those people have passed away, but like we said, we celebrate both alive and dead veterans, right? Veterans also include all the young sailors, airmen, soldiers, and Marines that are out there around the world on the deck of a carrier or a ship, standing watch, or in a foreign country. You know, they're making lifelong friends now. They're learning lifelong skills that they will keep with them. And they're missing their family and friends back home. So what does it mean to be a veteran? There's lots of ways to talk about it, but one, one analogy I like to use is that you can consider veterans as people who have chosen to be professional sheepdogs. You could consider that you know, most members of a peaceful society are like sheep. You know, they're good, gentle, productive people that only hurt each other by accident. And they live largely unaware, sometimes in denial, of the kind of dangers that are out there. And then there are those wolves, the violent, selfish creatures that have no ethical or moral compass. <clears throat> they have no empathy for others, and they feed on the sheep without mercy. And they're usually deterred only when faced with a strong defender of the flock. To the sheep, the sheep dogs, they actually appear a lot like wolves. <laughs> they, uh, they've got fangs and immense capacity for violence and can be pretty annoying. And many sheep actually wish the sheep dogs would just go away. But unlike the wolves, you know, the sheep dogs would never hurt a member of the flock. Their entire purpose actually is to protect those sheep from dangers like the wolves. So even if the sheep don't see the wolves around, Oftentimes they're there, but just hiding out of sight, knowing that the sheepdogs are ready and alert to come to their defense. So as we know, it's perfectly okay to hate war and still appreciate the warrior. And in fact, it is those seasoned warriors, the veterans, as was mentioned earlier, who hate war the most during our prayer for peace. Because the veterans know the costs, they've lost friends, and they have their own scars, physical or otherwise. But they also understand, veterans do, that sometimes war is a necessary last resort. We believe that there's something about our country that is worth fighting for. And that's actually evidenced today by all of you out here and kids up on the stage. At some point, you know, every veteran essentially writes out a blank check to the United States of America and it says, in the amount of, you know, up to and including, if necessary, my life. So American society has an interesting relationship with the military. And, uh, you know, an attitude that I see growing lately is one of kind of uncertain apathy. And, you know, if you ask why is that, I'd say it's really generational. 
And as I thought about it, it was very interesting. You know, in 1945, uh, one out of every 12 Americans was in the military. And we had just won World War II. Now, only one out of every 137 Americans is serving on active duty. That's less than one-tenth of what it was. You know, my dad was 18 years old. President Eisenhower was, was serving in the office. World War II vets were having baby boomer kids. The Korean conflict had just ended and the Cold War was going on. People saw a need for a strong military. My dad joined the Air Force. He served a couple of tours in Vietnam as a pilot and inspired my love of flying, but I was really too young to know much about Vietnam. And when I think about when I turned 18, you know, Ronald Reagan was serving in his second term as president. The military was very much in a period of growth as we were working to defeat Soviet communism. And by having a strong military, the Soviet Union broke apart politically, economically, and we, we really, without any direct conflict, pretty much won that contest. Now, I don't know if there's too many people here who are 18. Anybody here who's even close to age 18? Any of the scouts? I know a lot of the high schoolers aren't here with us today. You know, if you're 18 today, your parents are probably baby boomers who became adults during Vietnam. And both the Vietnam and the Cold War were really already over before you were born. On 9-11, a decade ago, somebody who's 18 today was 8 years old. So for the last 10 years, they've grown up seeing pretty much constant fighting in Iraq or Afghanistan, with very uncertain results, and many veterans coming home, as we know, missing limbs or in coffins. So the average 18-year-old today is probably not as familiar with the military service. What, they, what we see in the media is largely you know, not encouraging. But the many positive aspects of military service, there are, there are many of them, don't seem to come out as, as easily. It is nowadays a smaller niche profession, which is both good and bad. You know, it's good because a lot of Americans now can pursue their lives without having to worry as much about the sacrifices. But it is poor, it's unfortunate that a huge portion of our country isn't as familiar with some of the dangers out there or the benefits of having a strong military. You know, just in, in short, kind of with the today's threats, they're more insidious and but just as devastating as the ones of the past. A big concern now are things like a malicious cyber attack, a computer virus that could shut down large portions of our power grid across the country, or cause dams to release floods of waters into downstream communities. The potential for chaos and loss of life is still very real. The dangers have changed, but the military must adapt. To, uh, to meet these new threats and remain vigilant. So on 9-11, you know, you can see how many of us in uniform were really so heartbreaking because, you know, the way we looked at it, the wolves had found a way to get around the sheepdogs and kill so many of the flock. Many of us felt like we had actually failed in our mission. You know, we all know where we were. For me, I was on the USS Enterprise, aircraft carrier in the Indian Ocean. It was evening time over there. And we had just come out of two months or so flying over Iraq. And we were looking forward to going to a port visit in South Africa, in Cape Town, on our way back home. And of course, when the first airliner hit the first tower, all the ship engines stopped. And when the second airliner hit the second tower, we turned around and started heading back north. We actually were not very far from uh, where, about four or five weeks later, I started flying strike missions from my F-18 Hornet, about four or five hour missions, hunting down the Taliban and Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, hiding out in their mountain caves. That was 10 years ago. Many things have changed since then, but there are still wolves out there, and the next generation of sheepdogs are still needed to defend the flock. So how, do we, how should we think about Veterans Day? How could we celebrate it? The parades and ceremonies are fantastic. But you know, we all have many choices. You know, visiting a health care facility for the elderly, for the vets, bringing them food or just talking to them. You know, our heroes from World War II are dying off rapidly, about 800 every day. Within about 20 years, they will all be gone. You know, if you know somebody who served or is a military member, family member, military friend who's out serving now, give them a call, text them, you know, let them know you're thinking about them. Ultimately, I think, 
the, uh, the best way to honor the veterans, thank them, is to simply pay it forward. You know, just doing that unexpected favor to a stranger. Being honest and fair. And living, you know, our lives as Americans. Just being the best versions of ourselves we can be. Not today, but every day. And, you know, in many ways, this is precisely the example that our military people are taught to represent our nation around the world. In this way, we can show the world that uh, the cause for which veterans serve, who we are as Americans in our way of life, is not something to be scorned or fought against, but something to be admired, worthy of emulation. You know, in this age, we have global communication with, you know, cell phone texting, Facebook, Twitter. Our world is so interconnected, it's, there's really no other way to live, I think. We are all ambassadors for the United States, and the truth will always come out. So I'll leave you with a final thought. You know, my dad gave me great words of wisdom when I was about your, your age kids up there on the stage. I was about seven or eight, nine. My dad said to me, you know, you should always lead your life day to day as if everything that you do, everything you say, will be seen and known around the world. Now, I'll openly admit, I have not always heeded that advice. But it does remain with me today and uh, serves as a good guide. Imagine what our country would be like if we all could follow advice like that. So with that, I'll thank you very much for your time. Wish you all a safe, enjoyable holiday, and uh, God bless the United States. So Proctors, you can turn your sheets in on me after the meeting is adjourned, okay? Okay. We have a little remembrance to give to uh, Commander Robert Harrell from the post. You can hang it on his wall with, I'm sure, a thousand others like it, but this one's from the heart. It's a certificate of appreciation and grateful is gratefully presented to Commander Robert S. Harrell, United States Navy, in recognition and sincere appreciation of outstanding service and assistance which has contributed to the advancement of the American Legion programs and activities dedicated to God and country. From the members of the Florence Eastman Post 280 of the American Legion, Department of Massachusetts. Signed on today's date, November 11, 2011, by the Adjutant Barry Denham and myself, Michael Lamoureux, the Commander. Bob, it's a little gift from the heart. Thank you very much. We'll be, we'll be almost done. But the first one is, is I want to promise all the scouts and the people standing against the wall that next year there will be 20 chairs against that wall. <laughs> that's twice that's happened in two years. That's amazing. I hope everyone's all right. You all right there, police officers? Are you okay? Is he okay? She? Oop. All right. Um, the other thing is, is I would appreciate it. I would like all veterans in the audience and up here I don't care if you're combat or not, just that anyone who wore the uniform and volunteered to defend this country to please stand now.